about 2,900 years ago, students. A big pot like this ended up in a story in the book of the Bible called Second Kings. Let us find out what happened to this pot. There was a school by the name of Gilgal. Look at those, how those students look in dress for school. But on this particular day, Elisha the puppet was to visit. Good things always happened when the prophet Elisha visited the school. He always had time to listen to them. He gave them good counsel and encouraged them in their studies, just like you have to be encouraged. And the, the prophet was definitely coming that day. And the students were excited. Would, you, would Elisha answer my questions? They, they were asking themselves. Would he encourage other students to study the scriptures just like me? Would Elisha hear their stomachs growling? And why do you think their stomachs would growl? There was a famine in the land. So that means no rain, which also means dry land like what we are seeing there. No fruits, nothing to eat. Which means their stomach must be growling with no food to eat. But everyone still greeted Elisha excitedly. It was easy to see that the student looked forward to his visit. Look at how they are looking at him there with Elisha's nice clothes in the center there. Elisha smiled as he listened to their chatter. But he also noticed that the students look thin and a little pale. Don't you find so too? What's with them? Not looking so healthy like you all are, who are listening to the story. So one time, Elisha guessed, ah, I feel hungry. Elisha told his servant, go find a pot. Ah, that is how the pot come in. Go and get a big, 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 big pot. And go and look for some carrots. Go and make sure you get a lime. Put in some beetroot and pumpkin and any other vegetable you find and make a big stew for those students they're looking to peel. So Elisha's servant went, he got all the vegetables. He put on a big pot on the fire with plenty of water. He cut up all the things he had found and added them to the water and then threw in some wonder of the world and some time you must make good time in stew and guess what the smell of all that food went up into the nose and went up to the brain and their stomach started to growl more they didn't know what the servant had put in the stew but it smelled just right they hurried to wash their hands now after about 40 minutes on the pot and they get their bowls ready and everybody line up now to get the food. Look at those five of them in the line there. Soon they gathered on the big pot. They held their bowls out, eagerly waiting to be served. They called down the first set of bites. And after about the first three soup bites and drinking, somebody said, go out my stomach, my stomach, stop eating. And everybody stopped eating. So Elisha felt bad. Yeah, I make the soup and just so the, the, the stomach hurt in them. Oh, oh, the servant was shocked. Poison? How could poison get into that food? I made sure everything was just right. But who was watching all this time going on? God was watching and trying to teach them a lesson. Elisha and the students. The servant hurried away and soon returned with a sack of flour. What the cut flour do to take out poison from a pot of nice provision soup? We don't know. I never heard about that. But quickly, Elisha added the flour to the pot and stirred it. He tasted the stew after and told his servant to offer it back to the students. Because when Elisha tasted it, he realizes there was no poison. What do you think took place there would beginning with M? Miracle! Flour taking away poison? The servant must have hesitated because they never knew that flour could take away poison. Mm -hmm. Down to the students and all, in that short time, just feel that nobody poison could have come out. So they hesitated too. But 
Elisha trusted God and he trusted in God's path to make sure God was successful all the time with everything God does. Elisha realized the students needed food, he provided food. So with that poison in the food, and all that Elisha was feeling bad, the lesson that we have to learn is to obey what God says, even though you never heard such a command before. Whatever God says, you do it. Whether it's to take out poison from your food or to take out poison sin from your own life. Now is the time as students that we have to obey God throughout this week ahead. Just as Elisha obeyed God and put flour in soup to take out poison, God is there to take out all the poison in your life as students and teachers so that we can get ready to eat a better stew in paradise heaven. Have a great day. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called Free at Last. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. It says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Today's message is God helps me to be faithful no matter what happens. Have you ever had a dream that you couldn't remember? Or have you had a dream that didn't make sense? Today's story is about dreams that left someone very puzzled. Potiphar put Joseph in prison after Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of a crime. God knew that Joseph was innocent. He let Joseph go to prison anyway. Sometimes God lets his people be put in the strangest places for a special reason. God blessed Joseph even in prison. The prison warden noticed the good work that Joseph did. He soon put him in charge of the other prisoners. Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker were two of the men Joseph met in prison. One day, Joseph noticed that these men were sad. They both had just dreamed a dream they could not understand. Joseph knew about dreams. God had given him some important dreams when he was younger. He listened to the men's stories, and God helped him to tell them the meanings of their dreams. Everything he said would happen did happen. The cupbearer returned to work for the king, but the baker did not. Joseph had asked the cupbearer to mention him to Pharaoh in hopes of getting him out of prison. But the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph, and Joseph spent two more years in prison after that. One night, Pharaoh had two dreams. In the first dream, he saw seven fat cows eating grass on the riverbank. Then, out of nowhere, came seven skinny cows and ate them up. In a second dream, Pharaoh saw seven ears of healthy corn, and then suddenly, seven little unhealthy ears of corn appeared and swallowed up the healthy ones. These dreams disturbed Pharaoh so much that he couldn't go back to sleep. What did they mean? No one in Pharaoh's palace could understand the dreams. Then the king's cupbearer remembered Joseph, and Joseph was brought from prison. Joseph told Pharaoh that God sometimes gives people dreams. He had given these dreams to Pharaoh for a reason, and God had given Joseph the meaning of them. Your two dreams predict the same event, Joseph explained. For the next seven years, Egypt will grow more food than you could possibly use. The cows and the grain will be fat. Then the seven years 
after that will be very bad. No food will grow, and many people could starve. You should build more storehouses. Keep the extra grain grown in the fat years, Joseph suggested. If you do, Egypt will have enough food for the years of famine. Pharaoh agreed with Joseph. He decided that Joseph was a wise man, so he set him in charge of building the storehouses. Pharaoh gave Joseph his official ring. He gave him nice clothes. Nicer than those taken by his brothers or by Potiphar's wife, and he placed Joseph in charge of the entire country of Egypt. Truly, the Lord was with Joseph. He left Joseph in prison for a reason. When bad things happen to us, we can be faithful like Joseph. God can help us be faithful to Him. The God we are learning about in our home and church families, He can do great things with our lives, no matter where we go or what happens. This podcast is read by Franita Buddy for GraceLink.net, created and produced by Falvo Fowler, post produced by Faith Toe at Studio El Piso. The theme music is by Clayton Kinney. Animation and artwork by Giogo Godoy. The audio engineer was Karel Holness. For more information, please visit gracelink.net. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. We are going to do our junior lesson study for this week, and it's entitled "The Battle Belongs to the Lord." What did I say, juniors? I'm not hearing you. The battle belongs to the Lord. And as usual, we're going to start with our power text. Did you learn your power text for this week? So let's recite it together. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And this is taken from Romans chapter eight and verse thirty-seven. Let's look at our Bible. A、uh, quick snapshot of what our Bible lesson is this week all about. Jesus appears to Joshua as the commander of the Lord's army, and Joshua worships worships him and receives instructions from him on the battle plan for Jericho. The Israelites will simply just walk around the city, blow their trumpets, and shout, and the walls of Jericho will collapse, and God will give them the city. So let's hear the story as it unfolds. The fall of Jericho. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, "Are you for us or for our enemies?" Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, "What message does my lord have for his servants?" The commander of the Lord's army replied, "Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy." And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, "See." I have delivered Jer- Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day of march, around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, "Take up the ark of covenant of the Lord, and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it." And he ordered the army, "Advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord." When Joshua asked, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward. 
blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time the trumpets were sounded, but Joshua had commanded the army, Do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout! So he had the Ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on the day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua accompanied the army. Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted. To the Lord, only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared. Because, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the lord and must go into his treasury when the trumpet sounded the army shouted and at the sound of the trumpet when the men gave a loud shout the wall collapsed so everyone charged straight in and they took the city they devoted the city to the lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out, and all who belong to her, in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place, outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the city, everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced a solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his frame spread throughout the land. Thank you, Sonia, for that story that you just gave us there. As we see, Jericho was one of the principal centers of idol worship and that is why God destroyed them. They worship the goddess of fertility, Ashtoreth. So the city stood in defiance of God and Jericho was strong, you know. They had iron chariots, they had horses and they were really good at war. And here's another thing about Jericho. Their walls, their walls stood really, really high. Imagine their walls were over 32 feet tall. That is taller than about three stories high. And they were over two meters. So we see in the lesson gone that the Lord really, the battle really belonged to the Lord because the Israelites followed God's command to do as he commanded and they overtook Jericho. So as we end our lesson for today, let's remember to always put the battle in the Lord's hands 
So in our usual fashion, we will end this week with a prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for always being with us, for being our commander-in-chief and giving you the battle that we would win our battles. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Today I will be telling you about a girl named Eduarda. And Eduarda is 15 years old. Eduarda is from Brazil. When Eduarda was 11 years old, she fell in love with Jesus while listening to Bible stories in her primary class in Brazil. She wanted to serve, Je she wanted to serve Jesus, but she asked herself, how? Then her mother started a small Bible study group in their home. Once a week, several mothers who were not Seventh-day Adventists would come to her would come to their house to read the Bible and pray together. Sometimes the mothers brought their daughters who were six to eight years old. Eduarda thought it well, it would be nice if she could create a small special group just for the girls. Mothers, mother, she said, could I start a small group just for the girls who come with their mothers? Mother thought it was a splendid idea. Eduarda prepared a Bible story to share with the other girls. She chose several songs that they could sing together. And she put together a fun Bible quiz that they could play together. Three girls came to Eduarda's first meeting, then more girls came soon. Soon, 14 girls were participating in the small group every week. They came from different parts of the city, and their parents came from different religions. They enjoyed praying, singing, listening to Bible stories, and taking Bible quizzes. After a while, Eduarda thought it would be nice if the girls could meet more than once a week. She invited them to meet at a nursing home to visit and pray with the old people there. Then they went to a hospital to visit and pray with the sick people there. But when COVID-19 came, the girls could no longer meet together in person. So they met online for many months. Even though they were online, the girls still prayed, sing, listened to Bible stories, and took Bible quizzes. Today, the girls can meet in person once again, and they can even go to church together. Eduarda has seen the hearts of the girls. Some of the girls go with her to church on Sabbath, and one of them has even open a YouTube channel where she tells others about Jesus. Several other girls are planning to open small groups like Eduarda's. They want to share their love for Jesus just like Eduarda shared it with them. Eduarda's dream is that all the girls will give their hearts to Jesus. She hopes that they will tell their parents and everyone else they know about his love. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open four new churches in Eduardo's country, Brazil, so that more children can hear about the love of Jesus. Thank you for planning a generous offering on September 24th. Did you know the statue of Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro weighs 635 tons? is 125 feet high including its pedestal and has been named one of the new seven wonders of the world good morning boys and girls and happy sabbath now on the sixth day of creation god made the animals and man now animals bring such joy to our lives don't they some, anim some animals we can keep as pets at home, or for others, we can visit the zoo to look at and admire them. Now, God alone is creator, but when he created us, he gave us the ability to be creative. So this morning, to remind us of God as creator, 
we will use our creative skills which he has given us and craft two animals out of paper. The first one we are going to do is a dog. Now for this, you will need a square piece of paper. Very simple. You fold it over, crease, then you just take one end and you bring it down and you take another side about the same distance from the corner and you fold it down like that. So at this stage, two flaps folded. Then you take the lower part and you fold it up. So you have something, a shape like this. Okay? Now you're going to use two markers, two different colors, a dark color, so you can use preferably black and a red. Now we are just going to draw in some eyes. Now you're going to draw two circles as best as you can. It can be circles can be a little difficult to draw. And then you're going to do two inner circles. So you're going to do something like this and something like this. Okay, then you're going to do some inner circles here, a big one and a smaller one. And you're doing the same thing on the opposite side, a big one and a smaller one. And then we color in, color in the, the clear spaces. Like this. Okay, those will be our eyes. And then you take the red marker. We're going to try and do by the nose. So you start here and you just round it off. Like that. About halfway up, you draw another arch. And then to the bottom, you do the little two spaces for the nose and you color it in and then we come down here and we just put do something like that and there you have your dog all right we put this aside and we'll try the kitty cat similar again you take now you can use any color a square piece of paper fold it and this time we want to try from the center so we can average from here the center and we fold and we come on the other side and we do the same thing we fold and then we take to the to the okay doesn't quite match up so let me try again and then you turn up here and this one you turn over so you get the ears pointed ears up here and this will be the face for our kitty cat. We take our markers again and we draw two circles. One, two, and again we do, this time we do an inner circle. Just similar to the dogs and we do the same thing with the bigger one, the smaller circle. Big one, and we color in. Now, some of us are very artistic, so the eyes would look really nice. Then we just do a simple shape, similar to an oval, but we start to look so follow carefully. We do something like this, and we just color in here, and then we just come down here again like that and this time we can add some whiskers so you do one long one two shorter ones and you do the same thing on the other side one long one two shorter ones and there you have your kitty cat so the next time you may not have a car, um, cat or a dog at home as a pet but we can use our creative skill that god has given us 
and create our own paper animals. So, until next time, boys and girls, bye. <laughs>
carved it and made it look like the false goddess Asherah. And then he told the people, come and worship your new god. Ahab did more to get God vexed than any of the kings that came before him. But you see, it wasn't all the people. In the mountains of Gilead, east of the Jordan River, there was a man. One man, he had no high position in life. He didn't live in any great city. But you see, he saw what was happening in the land. He saw the utter craziness that was taking place. He remembered what happened when Israel continued along the path of getting God vexed. And he hoped in his heart that God would not totally destroy Israel because of what they were doing. He was one man. But you see, no matter how bad it gets, God always has one man. No matter how ridiculous things in the society get, God only needs one man to get the job done. Elijah was given a message. Elijah was given a mission and there was no hesitation. Elijah didn't ask to be the Lord's messenger. But when the word of the Lord came to him, nothing else mattered to him. Even though taking such a message to the king could mean certain death. Elijah already did this for them. Elijah left this mountain home and traveled day and night till he got to Samaria. On his arrival at the palace, the man didn't even wait to be announced or introduced. He walked straight into the palace dressed in his rough clothes and Batman attitude. The rough clothes he wore was an identifying mark of the prophets at that time. Past the soldiers, past the palace administration, past everybody who was just in shock and awe. He walked as if he owned the place. The man walked straight up to Ahab who was sitting on his, seated on his throne. Elijah then took look at Ahab dead in his eyes. The king was in shock. I mean, after all, how did the man get it and make it past the guards? It's not anybody who could just walk into a palace. But on top of that, he didn't bow or show any respect to the king. He looked at him man to man. Then Elijah started to speak. As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no rain except by my will. Judgment had finally come from God. You see, the worshippers of Baal had been. That was him who sent the rain and the dew and all the bodies of heaven. But now God had shut them off. God shut down the water treatment plant. God hit Israel hard like Wasa. No water till I say so. Some friends have encouraged you to try rooms pepper in doubles. Mm. <laughs> it is start off as a small thing. You're not really taking it over. You're having a good time. You're enjoying yourself. But as soon as you take your first bite, your mouth starts to burn. Then your ears start to burn. Then your stomach starts to burn and feel hot. Then your burp and it burns. Then in an effort to ease the pressure on your body, you start a cold sweat. Mucus didn't even know your hands started to flow. Snack coming out your nose too. No red solo helping, no water to fix this. And now you're wondering whose stupid idea was this. This is how Ahab was feeling. But by the time Ahab was experiencing this, Elijah had already slipped back out. Could you imagine how Ahab was feeling? First of all, a man walks into your palace and delivers such a message. And nobody stops him. But then the man slips back out without even getting a chance to arrest him. This has to be the biggest security blunder in history. Ahab instructed his men at once to find Elijah and bring him back to the palace. Elijah was already out of the palace and heading to the broker chariot as the Lord had directed him. The Lord promised him that he would have food and water, fresh flowing water from the book, and ravens were to bring him bread every day. Every day ravens brought me like your bread and meat. I don't know where they get it from, but what I know is when God promises that he will take care of you, he most definitely will. And he will do it in such a way to make you sit back and say that could only happen with God. After a while, however, the brook dried up. I mean, there was no rain to replenish the brook. You see, as soon as Elijah spoke those words to the king, God closed the main water line from heaven. The word now started to spread to the land of Israel about the rough looking man who just barged into the palace with a word from God, saying that water God did he say so. Some people refused to believe. I mean, after all, this was green, the streams were flowing, rivers were flowing. How could this be possible? Oh, well, so they thought. Whether you wanted to believe it or not, that didn't change the fact that water was gone. And God said, not for it till I say so. Could you imagine? Is he here since you made? Could you imagine no water to flush the toilet? Or to give you dogs some water? Or to wash clothes? Or to water plants? No water to drink. Now in Trinidad, if you take water for two weeks, 
People ready to burn tires in the road, fight for the government, march up the right house and tell TV6 that PNM don't no like poor people. And use some choice words to describe yourself. So how could you, or could you imagine what would happen to our country if they had to go for years without water? Could you imagine the state of calamity, confusion and nastiness in Israel? In, in looking at the situation that was unfolding, Jezebel as well as the prophets sought to encourage the people that Elijah had to be wrong, that the rain would come if they continued to trust in the air. Now this was all well and good when the place was looking green and nice and rivers were flowing. As time went on, however, no, no rain falling, extremes dried up, the countryside dried up, the Lord was running water and the people could burn tires, protest, curse the government, march from the Red House, complain the government, no like poor people, it really didn't matter. God hit Israel hard like Wasa. No water till I say so. The Lord told Elijah to go to Zarephath when he directed a widow there to organize him. When Elijah got to the city gate, he saw a woman there collecting sticks. He said to her, Mom, please bring me some water to drink. When she turned around to get the water, he also said, Also bring me some bread. The woman then said to Elijah, Sir, as the Lord lives, all I have is a little oil and some flour. I am going to get these sticks to make one last bread for me and my son, and we will eat it and die. Elijah then said to her, Don't worry about it. Go and make something for me to eat first, and then make something for you and your son. The Lord has said that your oil and your flour will not run up until I open the water like the gate. Of all the bold faced things to ask, of all the bold faced things to ask, how could you tell a woman who is going to make the last meal for her and her son? To make one for you first, and then go ahead and make one for yourself and the son. That is a next level of bold faceness. However, that is also a next level of faith. You see, what God wants to do doesn't have to make sense to us. What we have to do is trust it whether it makes sense or not. And that is what the woman did. The woman was willing to put her needs as well as her life and that of her son on the line to follow God. The woman was willing to sacrifice all to follow the instructions of God, and that is why she was saved. But God didn't just tell her to do that. He instructed the woman and he gave her a promise. He promised to take care of her when she risked it all to follow his word. And God will do the same thing for us today. He asks us to follow his word, but in his instructions, he promises to take care of us when we risk everything for him. The woman did just as Elijah had said, and guess what? The flour and oil didn't run out so that they were able to eat and keep eating. One day, however, the woman's son came in. The boy was so ill that he died. When the woman saw this, she started crying and said to Elijah, What have I done to you, man of God, that you have come to call my sins to remembrance and kill my son? Elijah took the boy in his arms and placed him on his bed. Elijah then prayed to God, saying, Lord, who is this? Have you decided to punish the woman with whom you sent me to stay? Elijah stretched his body over the boy three times. Then he prayed, Lord, please return this boy to life. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the boy became alive once again. When the woman saw her son was alive, she said to Elijah, Now I know that your words are true and that you are a man of God. After three years, after three years, you guys see how long the flower and oil lasted? Three years! The word of the Lord came to Elijah. The Lord told Elijah, the dog, let me go down the road and with these fellas. So Elijah went back to Samaria to show himself to Ahab. As he went along the way, he saw the effects of the bad famine in the land. What is famine? No water, no food, no food anywhere, no grocery, no parlor, no market, no nothing. The, gov the governor of the king's palace was a man by the name of Oedaya. Now he was a good man, a godly man. So much so that when Jezebel decided to kill the prophets of God, he took them and hid them in two caves and fed them. Since there was no food, Ahab and Obidiah decided to split up and search the country for food so that they would at least be able to save some of the animals. As Obidiah went on his way, he met Elijah. He immediately fell on his face and said, Are you my lord Elijah? Elijah said to him, Yes, I am Elijah. And go and tell Ahab that Elijah is here. Obidiah replied, Me, buddy? Me, you want to go and tell Ahab what? You want a man kill me? 
What have I done to you to deserve this? Listen, you don't know what has been going on down here. Ahab has been looking for you all over the place. The man sent word into all the neighboring countries looking for you. When they reported that you weren't here, he made them swear and oath that you weren't there. And now you just want me to go up the road and say that I happen to meet you on the road. The man will surely kill me. You want me to go and tell him that I have seen you. And let's say this prayer of the Lord takes you to another place and I can't find you when I reach back. Listen, I am a good man. I tried to be my good man. When Jezebel wanted to kill all the prophets, I killed them and killed them and kept them alive. Now you just want me to go to my death? Elijah then said to him, How about hey, don't be tough, I'm waiting right here. So Obadiah went and told Ahab what happened and brought him to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Man, is you here causing all this trouble in the place? Elijah then replied, Hey man, is you, your father, your grandfather, look, is you and all your relatives causing all this trouble down here? You decided that you weren't going to follow the commandments. You introduced me a worship with that crazy woman and decided to marry and call your wife. Now here was his scene. Call Israel. Call the 450 prophets that eat at Jezebel's table. Call the 400 prophets that operate in the grove. Tell them, come and meet me on Mount Carmel. The challenge had been delivered. The proverbial gauntlet had been thrown down. The day of the session had been set. It was one man against 850 prophets of Israel. One man under the direction of God was about to come face to face with the apostasy that had swept over the land. God had one man and that one man was going against a nation. The sun rose on a clear morning up on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is located in the northwest of Israel and is a beautiful and fertile place. It contains lush forests and orchards around it. But you see, it was also a high place. And it was mentioned as a high place by Tristan Lino, the Egyptians who were experts in idol worship. A high place is a center which is dedicated to the worship of a particular God. This is not the place where to worship God because God instructed the people to destroy all these high places. So everyone knew that this was a center of idol worship. Elijah was going to the heart of idol worship to challenge what was taking place in Israel. Elijah was going to challenge Baal in his house. Very soon, people from all over Israel started to gather on the mountain. On that mountain, bright and early, they saw Elijah, one man, standing alone. Soon the prophets of Baal started to arrive with all their pomp and ceremony and fanfare. With King Ahab in tow, they dressed and looked their best as they paraded themselves up the mountainside in view of the entire assembly with music and dancing and a herald and dancing their arrival and clearing the path. They were surely a sight to behold as 850 of them came up the mountain. By this time, onlookers were gathered by the thousands all around the mountain. After the procession had arrived and settled themselves, Elijah then stepped up and started to speak. How long are we going to do this thing? How long are we going to play in the river on the bank? If we are let's go and serve him. But if the Lord is going and serve him, the people didn't say a word. Could you imagine that? These people who God brought out of Egypt. These people who God set apart from the rest of the world because of his servant Abraham. These people who God had led to the promised land through a desert with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night had nothing to say. The people who lived for 40 years in a desert with food and water provided had nothing to say. The people had been so messed up by the idol worship that nobody could have said, Yeah, boy, Elijah, we've been this thing for too long, we know we are slack. What a situation, what a position for God's people to be in. They were so lost that they needed a sign to reignite the fire for God within them that had been extinguished by idol worship. But you see, their hesitance and unbelief didn't face us where Elijah. Elijah said to the people, I am the last man, Jack. I alone remain as a prophet of God. But look at how much of them come up here. 850 of these fellows are prophets of Baal. Hear what? Bring us two young boys. Let us prepare them. I will prepare mine, and they will prepare theirs. But do not like the sacrifice. Let them call on the name of, of their God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Now the people all of a sudden got a voice and said, well, yeah, that makes sense. So Elijah gave the prophets of Baal the option to choose which bull they wanted, and told them, well, organize all this, but remember, no fire. So the prophets of 
they had organized the sacrifice and started up the chant. Shout harder, started prancing around in order to get me to answer them, but there was no answer. Elijah had to watch them closely because if they could, if they could, they would light the fire themselves. And see that they had and started it. At around midday, Elijah started to get tired of the craziness and started to taunt them. Hey, all every man probably not home. All they ready made me climb up this mountain and forget to check and see if the man will be home. Now, nah, man, I refuse to believe that. Call Anna. Or he probably sleeping, call Anna. Make some more noise, he probably don't be back here. Then he, he continued to turn them further, saying, All your show, all your show, and up around in the wrong house. I thought this was a high place. Stretch your hands higher, maybe you'll get better reception. When the prophets heard this, when they heard this, those fellas started to behave madder than man. They started cutting up themselves with knives until their blood started to flow and shout at the top of their lungs. They were accustomed to doing this in their idol worship. Whole day they were at it with shouting and blood and frantic and erratic behavior. But there was no answer. Nothing happened. When Elijah had enough of them, he said to the people, God, come, come close to me. Then he proceeded to rebuild the altar of God that had been torn down. He then prepared the sacrifice for the altar, following which he dug a trench around the altar and proceeded to dredge it with water three times until the water had filled up the trench. Elijah then knelt and prayed this prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things by your command. Immediately, immediately the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the water, it even burnt up the ground. When the people saw this, they fell on the ground and shouted, The Lord is God! The Lord is God! The Lord is God! Elijah then said to the people, You see those fellas, those prophets, all your whole those false prophets, every one of them, don't let anybody escape. We're going down the Kishan Valley and there we put in every one of them to death. Elijah then said to Ahab, Go home, eat, water come back, no beat up. As Ahab went on his way, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Cam, bent down on his knees and put his head between his knees. Then he said to his servant, Go out and look over the sea and tell me what you see. When the servant went, he looked up, he saw nothing. Six times there was nothing to see. On the seventh time, the servant saw a cloud like a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah said to his servant, Go and tell Ahab to get on his chariot before the rain stops him. As he was speaking, however, the sky became black and a strong wind accompanied the darkness. Heavy rain, bucket and jump started falling and Ahab was caught in the rain on his way to Jezreel. It was so much rain that he couldn't see the road ahead. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and man listened to this. Elijah held the reins of the horses and ran all the way to Jezreel. In front of the chariot needed Ahab. Elijah led Ahab to, Ahab to the gate of his palace and then went on his way. God opened the water line once again. The water came back and the wave of idol worship that had spread so rapidly across Israel had finally been brought to an end. Lay die, lay die, lay The land was ripe with the wrong, with praise the man in every song, and with each day the knowledge of God trampled on and down. It was under a half apostasy start, he led Israel down the idolaters path. Soon there remained no knowledge of God left in Israel's heart. 
Israel got bad, badder and bad, with people behaving madder than bad. No concern, no thought for those who had had. God soon said, enough is enough, and for the next three years, it was a line bus. No jewelry till Israel turns and remembers my name. From the countryside, Elijah came to deliver the judgment in God's name. No jewelry till Israel turns and remembers my name. From the countryside, Elijah came to deliver the judgment in God's name. No jewelry till Israel turns and remembers my name.